Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I hope that everybody can hear me. I have a little cold over the weekend. Um, you know, that's why I'm uh, this, this bonbon. And, but I hope you can hear me. If not, please give me a shout. Uh, I think this is, this, is, this is the main trick. Yeah? I will uh, try to teach you today how to escape the shots. Or to make we are uh, more precise how to find the closure where there are simply no sharks. That's the trick in the closure strategy. Not really to escape the sharks, but to swim in that region of the ocean where there are no sharks, which means that there's no market uh, competition. You can make your own pollution, uh, you can build on your own strategy, you can build on your own business model. That's what my lecture is today about. So today I'm talking a lot. Uh, tomorrow we will uh, shift it a little bit. Tomorrow it's, it's, it's two workshops. And I think it's perfect because that we start today and we have the workshops uh, tomorrow because this will give you time overnight to think about your own ideas. So at the end of my lecture, when you hopefully are familiar with the, with the play ocean strategy, I will again ask you to come up with your ideas for tomorrow. Then in the workshop, I would like to, to split you in uh, whatever, two or three groups. I think we are... Six, six, seven, 17 or 16, I'm not sure. Just count it too, 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 too fast. 16 or 17 pupil, uh, students, so maybe two groups, three groups tomorrow in the workshop. And every uh, workshop team will build their own lotion strategy. But that's for, to, uh, for tomorrow. For today, uh, I will try to, to teach you how to, to swim out in the, in the blue ocean. Maybe just a few words about my person that you have some uh, impression. Who is, who is talking to you today? Uh, as you already have been told, I'm now working uh, for industry for, for many years. Uh, at, uh, from my educational point of view, I studied uh, chemistry and mathematics at the University of Vienna. I was working as a lecturer at the University of Vienna and uh, Cambridge for more than 10 years, and then I shifted to industry. So my main focus was uh, material science, physical chemistry, and then in the industry I'm still responsible for material science, but material science of course also including innovation, R&D, and nowadays I'm more in the, in the R&D management and in the, in the innovation management uh, for one of the uh, world largest uh, paper and packaging companies. So what my company normally is doing is producing paper and packaging and many other things. So this is my, my background. Here's the presentation. <coughs> so, Closion is an innovation tool, an innovation strategy, how you can find your own completely new business model where there are no sharks, where you can make your own market, and where you can think completely out perform your competitors because there are no competitors in the blue that's the, that's the main trick. So when we talk about innovation, uh, I always like to, to start this, this kind of lectures with a very easy but maybe tricky question. Who of you can define what is innovation? Very simple, one sentence, what is innovation? Anybody? What is innovation? Everybody is talking about innovation. Politicians, uh, CEOs, leaders, even housewives and housemen, if they look at the TV spots, you can always see some innovative products and whatever. But what is innovation? What is the definition of innovation? Anybody who is not shy? So one thing for innovation is always innovation must be new. It's the normal answer. But only new is not enough. It's definitely not enough. So if you have something new, it's not innovative. Yeah? This is new. And? It should be implemented in the market. Thank you so much. It must be new and you must make money with it. It must be already in the market. So if any colleague at the university tells you that he's innovative or that he's doing some innovations, you can just talk to or you can just ask him how much money did you do with, the work, with your work? Because if it's not in the market, 
then you are inventive, but you're not innovative. That's the main difference, and many, many people don't, don't realize the difference. Normally at the university, you start with being inventive. You invent something, something new, which is, of course, the basis for innovations. But all, only when these new thing, things come to the market, if you can buy it, <coughs> then, then it's an innovation. So, that's also the main, the main difference between, let's call it R&D, research and development, and innovation. Don't write down the, the full term, but you can remember it. Research and development, or invention, to invent something new. This is always you get some money, so you're turning money into knowledge. That's invention. It's R&D. You normally do at the university. You don't do it for many, many years in Vienna and Cambridge. You get money and you invent something. You write a paper, you publish it, you talk on a conference to a colleague, etc. So you're turning money into knowledge. You're turning money into ID, intellectual property. And innovation is just the opposite. You are turning IP, you are turning knowledge into money. Which of course also means that each of one needs the other one. So it's a cycle. And vice versa. So innovative companies need R&D, of course. But R&D without any, any innovation, R&D without, without getting to the market, without producing any Consumable, consumable uh, goods, at the end of the day, are useless in the long term. And these two must go hand in hand for the uh, economic and social uh, success of the country. That's the definition of innovation. So why do we need some, some, some new innovation strategies? It's clear we need innovation, and Blue Ocean is a strategy to create something new. And why do we always need something new? This is also a very easy explanation. You know that all products, all goods, all consumables, consumables in the, in the world, we always have this, this kind of S-curve. Maybe you know it. Who knows the, the S curve in the market? Anybody here who studies economics? Or you all natural scientists or whatever? Natural scientists, technicians? If you have a product, you always have to ask yourself. You have here the time, and here you have the whatever. Profit, whatever. The number of sold products. Start with a new product, which of course means that here you need innovation. Yeah? You invent something new and you start with it. And at the very beginning, it's always very hard to get into the market, even if you have a really exciting new idea. Because you always, normally you always have some competition, you always have to compete with some other devices which are already in the market. And then, if you're lucky, you get into that more or less linear region here. Yeah? You're scaling up. This is normally when from the inventors, the managers take over. They're scaling up the process. They're really making money, really making money. <coughs> but at the end of the day, the lifespan of the product will decrease again. You will sell less, and maybe another technology will get over. And that's why you need strategies to be innovative again. That's why when you should come up with some new innovations, then when your blue ocean strategy should fill this gap and you should begin with the next S curve. When other words, it's a cycle again. You're getting back. Close the 
the board of managers, yeah? You can just think of the, of the nobles, yeah? I guess I'm the oldest novel in the intellectual. I'm pretty sure, yeah? <coughs> Nobody knows it. I'm pretty sure everybody of you has, 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 has a smartphone. My wife has a smartphone, all my friends have a smartphone, and maybe I next year will also have a smartphone. So, normal mobiles that just vanish, yeah? Whatever you think about it, if you, think, if you say, okay, that the battery is long, last <coughs> one week, like that model, and I'm used to it, and blah, 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 they just vanish. The normal mobiles are here. You're not making any profit, yeah? And the smartphones are taking over. So the next SQL is the smartphone, uh, begins. And maybe 10 years ago, something like that, 10 years ago, I was always told by my colleagues and my wife and my friends that you need a Nokia. Well, you, I guess you want Nokia. You know Nokia. Yeah. I was told if you, if, if you have a Nokia a mobile, then you, are, yeah, you can be proud of it and you can, can uh, you know, show it to your friends and your colleagues. And if you don't have a Nokia, you are, you are nothing. Yeah? You need a Nokia. You know that what happened to Nokia, Nokia more or less just left over the, 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 the smartphone wave. Smartphones came, but, but Nokia were well, not uh, hoping on the train which were leading to the smartphones. They were just sticking to normal robots. They were making excellent robots, but they were much too late with respect to the smartphones. And uh, you know what happens, for example, with, with the iPhone? Nowadays, if you want to impress your friends, you need the, 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 the new iPhone, the iPhone 5, I guess. Yeah? You, cannot, you cannot impress anybody uh, with a Nokia. So, if you're at the end of the cycle and you don't come up with something new, so if you don't have a good innovation strategy, your company will get less and less profitable, and maybe a company will always will eventually vanish, or at least uh, the stock prices like for Nokia will go down, you will get into troubles, etc. etc. So it's very important that you always close the loop and that you have a very good strategy to come up with new innovation. And that's why I will try to tell you to make you familiar with the evolution strategy because I think in my personal experience of my colleagues, this is one of the most easiest tool, even a natural scientist like me understands it. Yeah? You know, as I told you, normally I'm a material scientist, so quantum mechanics is not a problem for me, but if the economical theories are getting too complicated, then I'm getting nervous. But the ocean is very simple, it's a very simple theory, very easy to use, and it's a very mighty tool. So if you do it in the, in the right way, you can really cover this completely new business models from very simple ideas. And that's what I will try to do today. And you will do it tomorrow. Uh, the method is a uh, camps from the US, as so many uh, economic series come from. And that's the, 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 the book. In principle, uh, it's, uh, it's based on a very huge uh, analyze from uh, Harvard Business School. At that time, it was one professor, it was uh, Professor Kim and one of his uh, PhD students, many. Nowadays, both, both are professors. And they used uh, a data of more than 130 companies in a time span of more than 100 years. And they looked at completely different uh, industries like pharmacy, automotive, airplanes entertainment, computers, etc., etc. And what they try to figure out is what are doing or what distinguishes successful companies or successful company strategies from non-successful companies and what can you learn from it and if you can make some kind of toolbox for the user. If you say if you're using this and that tool, then you will be more likely successful than the other one. So it's a toolbox, no strategy. And it's, yeah, more or less written down in the book. So some key, some uh, key messages of the book. 
as a dog already. Every product has a lifespan. In the economist, it's called the so-called true beta way, very low. Schumpeter, an Austrian economist, was one of the first to define innovation as we did in the, in the beginning innovation, something new which brings money. And Schumpeter was also one of the first to describe this, this cycle, this way of that every product has a lifespan and it will vanish and something new will uh, come up. And the same <coughs> is of course also true nowadays. More than 60 years after the death of uh, Schumpeter. So, the basic message is there are no permanently successful industries and there are no permanently successful companies. Again, Nokia. Well, you can take nearly any other company. The companies who are very successful at the moment, yeah? at the moment, Apple, I think, is doing an excellent job, even after, even so, uh, Steve Jobs died. I think they're still doing a great job. I guess so. I guess many, many people will, will try to, to, to buy the iPhone 5. But you cannot be sure that Apple will also do a great job in 5 years or 10 years. So you never ever can be sure that just because a company is now successful or was successful in the past will also be uh, successful in the future. So this is really more or less a job matter. There are no permanently successful companies. Same, for example, for, for IBM, who also faced a lot of troubles in the, in the 80s after doing great jobs in the 60s and 70s. And nearly every company you know uh, is an example of that. But what is the main difference? Why some companies still existing, doing a great job at the moment, some already vanished, did get bankrupt, Etc. So, the main difference, as the Bloch also uh, point out, is that successful companies already try to fill in some new business models. So, when the end of a, of a loop comes, of this S curve, so when the true meter wave comes and vanishes all, all, all old products, so the normal mobile phones are gone. Normal uh, PCs are done, whatever. Huh? And successful companies with their IT departments and innovation departments together, they have something new which they can take out and they can, stay, they, can, they can start a new success story. So it's very important for successful companies not to wait to the end of a product life span, but here, when everything is getting, uh, you're doing a great job. You're getting a lot of money, you're getting a lot of money, you're really doing profit. You should already think about some new product because the end will come. Well, you say more pathetic, the end is near. The end, the end is always near for a product. You must never forget that. Whatever successful a product might be, it will always have an end. So when you are successful, you should always think one step, at least one step further, what could come after this product. <coughs> so you always try, you always must try to find some new solutions. And the main, uh, the main focus for innovations and of course also for lotion innovation should always be the, 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 the bio value, the, the value innovation. And what, what the authors and what I mean is, that you must look at the real value which the customer needs. Yeah? Good example is, for example, is always uh, Microsoft Office. I guess all of you know or uh, use Microsoft Office, Word, Excel, Excel PowerPoint, whatever. Yeah? And when a new version of this uh, great uh, software suite comes out, you will find a lot more features in it. Yeah? Every version gets more features. And I'm pretty sure that you, like me, don't use, well, maybe use 10% of the features. Yeah? And the rest of the features, you even don't know that, and you will definitely, definitely not use them. So if the print on the, on the new uh, software cover, whatever, instead of 600 features, now my Word has 700 features. I don't really care. Yeah? I'm only using uh, 20 or 30 features of Word. 
just forget about the rest. Now, this is typically innovation or something new which the customer does not really need. What you normally really need is maybe software which is more easy to use, which is more intuitive, but not some more fancy uh, features built in the software. So you should always put focus on the buyer value. What do the customer, what do the buyer really need? And secondly, normally, as you already have been told in the morning, there are these blue oceans and there are red oceans, where the sharks are waiting for you. And in, in, in the red ocean, normally you always have two, uh, two choices as a customer. You have this high-end products and you have the low-end products, which means you can either buy a Porsche, which costs a lot of money, and you can drive fast on the highway if the police don't catch, catches you. Or you can buy whatever, a Dacia, which costs maybe a tenth of a Porsche. You can also drive on the highway. It's also a nice car. But of course, you have less features. And of course, it's not the car to, to, to impress your friends. So in the normal world, you have two choices. High-end and high-priced product, and low-end and low-priced product. That's the typical red ocean. Or if you buy a new television set, Nowadays, the television sets are going, uh, the, the diagonal is getting wider and wider. But if you compare the prices in the shop, you will see that for a certain width of the, of the, of the TV screen, the prices are in a distinct range. You will find some products which are slightly below and some which are slightly above. But it's, it's, a, it's a range for the products. And this is typically Red Ocean. Just look about the width and you look about the, the brilliance and maybe if this television can also do some uh, 3D uh, television for you at home. There's nothing really to differentiate. Yeah? It's all about price. So this is typically red ocean. And what you try to break down in blue ocean is to break down this train off between price and value. So you try to find some new business models where you have both. You have no cost to have a price which makes sense for the customer, which the customer is really paying to win, and really a different, uh, a different product, really kind of different date from the, from the rest of the market. That's normally the secret of Plosion. Yes, and again, of course, this famous example of Nokia, <coughs> who completely overlooked the new technology, the, the smartphone technologies. And now, nowadays, Nokia is also offering a smartphone, so they try to get on that train in the meantime, but I think they have lost incredible uh, amount of money. Okay, blue and red oceans. This is the bloody water. Sharks have hit you. Typically, me too markets and most of the markets and most of the consumers, consumer, consumables you buy are in the red ocean. Normally, when, you, when we go to the supermarket, or when we buy a car, whatever we do, we are buying red ocean products. And very seldom we are buying blue ocean products. So, why should you, from a financial point of view, be interested in that? Uh, Blue Ocean strategy. And this is normally the slide I show to, to the CEOs, CEOs of a, of a company. When we talk about Blue Ocean strategy, and if it makes sense for a company to implement this uh, Blue Ocean strategy, why does it make sense? And you know, a CEO normally is interested in some financial figures. Yeah? We always look at the financial data. The rest is, yeah, it's important for the company, but the financial figures are normally most important. We don't have a company to see of the company, to the legal of the company. So why should we, as it is not easy to develop the blue ocean, yeah? normally we are in the red ocean, why should we try to make the blue ocean? Why should we invest in it? And 
uh, what will be the, the outcome on the, on the financial figures. And on that slide, you, can, you, have, you have the answer in a nutshell. Yeah? You can see here that according to the, to the Harvard Business School, about 14% of the products which are developed in the companies are uh, so you, you could call them lotion products. Huh? Above 40% could also be 10% yeah, industry uh, branches with maybe 20%. But 10 to 14% are uh, product launches <coughs> which you could call blue ocean. So most of the products are launched in the red ocean. If you look at the, at the turnover, <coughs> the revenue, then you see that about one third of the, of the turnover comes from blue ocean products. Also, only 40% are launched. About one third of the, of the, of the turnover comes from this uh, blue ocean product. And when we look at the profit, what the company really wants with the product, then you can see that about two thirds of the profit comes from the blue ocean product. So only 14% of the products now uh, make two thirds of the profit at the end of the day. And this is normally really the reason when I'm able to convince and see you, the CEO that we should go for the blue ocean strategy. These two figures. If you really find a blue ocean book like the iPhone, like many other examples, you can make a lot of profit. Of course, you can also fail with a blue ocean book. Blue ocean is not a 100% uh, security that you will not fail, you can also fail in the market. But if you are successful with a blue ocean product, you can make enormous profit because you build up your own market. There are no sharks there, there are no competitors there. You can define your own market borders. You can influence your customers, you, know, you, you can wake up your customers what the customer really needs. In the red ocean, the, the customer knows what he wants. He seems to know what he, what, what he needs. In the blue ocean, you can tell the customer what he could make. And if you can convince the, if you can convince the customer that he needs it, then you have a perfect market position. You can just think of the beginnings of the, of, of the iPhone when, uh, you know, people were sitting or sleeping in front of the, of the Apple shop, shops just to be the first one to get the iPhone. And the iPhone was first in, introduced to market. People were absolutely crazy about the iPhone. For what reason ever, huh? They were, before the shop opened, in the night, the people came to the shop, they, they camped in front of the shop just to be the first one to be really sure they have the iPhone. And these people, they don't care about the price. They are willing to pay nearly every amount just to get the iPhone. And that's why blue ocean products make that much profit. You can give the customer something where the customer thinks that he really needs it and he doesn't ask for the price. So if you want to distinguish between a red ocean and a blue ocean product, it's very simple for you. If you go into shop and you ask for the price, then normally you ask asking for a red ocean product. If you go to the shop and you ask, do you have that? Then you ask for a blue ocean product. So if you, whatever, you of nice ladies sitting there, if you go to the shop and you want a new pair of shoes, yeah, a new handbag or whatever, and you just ask the lady in the shop, do you have this new, brand new whatever? And she says yes, and you say, wow, wow, I need it. And that, that's for you a blue ocean product. You don't ask for the price, you just want this new style. <coughs> if you go to the shop and you ask if, this, if the price is uh, 49 euros or is it, is it maybe 48 euros, and if it's 48 euros you are willing to go to another shop, then it's a typical red ocean product. You're just asking for the price, and if, if you get a small percentage lower 
somewhere else and if you get some discount, then you're happy. So for a company, of course, finding these blue oceans, and with the blue ocean strategy having really two toolbox, a systematic way to find these blue oceans is extremely important. And so can, you can again make a lot of profit with it. You can really secure that the company will also be successful in the future. Uh, once again, to distinguish between the red ocean and the blue ocean, the red ocean means that you have a market and you compete <coughs> in the existing market. And blue ocean is you, you create the market. The market is not here. You make it. Here it's about competition. In the blue ocean, there is no competition. There are no sharks. You have some demand, and you get a piece of the cake, and here you create the demand. The demand is not yet here. You create it. Here, normally, as I told you, you have correlation between cost and value, either high cost or low cost, and you as a customer, you must decide. Do we want to get a Porsche or do we want to buy a taxi or whatever? In the blue ocean, you try to break off this normal correlation. And you try to make both. You want to offer a customer a huge product, but at a low or as a considerable price. That's the trick. So this was all now why Blue Ocean is interesting, but so far, of course, I've not told you anything how you can find this Blue Ocean, just to give you some examples. In the next slides, you will find that the summarizes how you can find this Blue Ocean. First of all, in the Blue Ocean toolbox, we have four cornerstones. You always try to reduce something You try to eliminate something, you try to find something, you try to erase something, to create something, or to increase something. So, eliminate means that if you're running a business and all your colleagues are telling you that for the last decades, for 30 years, whatever, the customer needs this and that. And then you ask, you ask nasty questions and you ask them, do you really think the customer needs that? Or you're asking the customer, you're making workshops. And maybe you find out the customer does not really need it. Why not eliminate it? Just kick it out. You can reduce the cost. If you find a feature of your product which the customer does not need, kick it out. This is not always easy, yeah? If you can find something, and don't say, okay, because we did it for the last 20 years, just kick it out, and I will uh, show you some examples. Or, if you don't want to completely kick it out, reduce it. Maybe your customer does not need this high end of complexity. Maybe your customer does not need so many features in a, in a, in a software field. Maybe only 50 features, maybe only 50 icons would do the same job for the normal customer. And, at the same time, you create something which is not yet in, in the old products. Like in the iPhone, you give the, oops, uh, you give the, the, the customer a, a mobile where you can very easily access the internet, where you can share your photos with, with your friends, you can easily go to, to Facebook, etc., etc. I mean, you, I'm pretty sure you, you know much better than I do what, what you all can do with a, with a, with a, with a, with a smartphone. And Ten years ago, nobody had a smartphone and nobody really needed it. No? It was a funny time because we had just this normal uh, telephone, this normal uh, mobile. And maybe 20 years ago, nobody had a, no had a mobile. No? When I was in your age, maybe, like you, when, uh, when I tried to date it, some nice female college, you know, during the lecture you could just say, okay, at whatever, 8 p.m., we will meet at that restaurant. 
but there was absolutely no chance to film in between. And to say, oh, I'm late, I will come 15 minutes uh, late, uh, or, um, or let's, let's change the meeting. We just had a, had a fixed meeting uh, time and place, and then you, you were waiting there. And if you are if the, if the student, your friend, whatever, did not come, you had no chance to call him or her and say, hey, why are you late? Where are you? So you waited maybe for 15 minutes. If the, the lady was really nice, you waited for half an hour maybe. And then you just gave it up and you went home. And 10 years after that, you had these, these mobile phones. Now you could really give them a call. And nowadays, you can really even go to the internet. You can, you can sit in a bar and if you uh, discuss something with your friend, you can have a quick look at, uh, at, 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 at Google, at, at Wikipedia, whatever. You can have access to information all over the world, anytime, any place, wherever you sit. This is, this is definitely a need, where, or a need what, what people 20 years ago did not have. We didn't really even think that this could be. Yeah? Well, typically when there are also some uh, results from, from old workshops with, with uh, uh, telephone users, and 20 years ago, when the big companies asked the normal use of a telephone, you know, these old telephones with the cable, yeah, not that, with the cable, normal telephone which we had in the home of our parents. When they asked them, what would you expect from a telephone? What would make it easier? <coughs> you know what, what the customers told them? They didn't tell them, hey, I would like to have a, a gadget where I can take out in the garden and talk to my friends. They were just telling them, Ooh, the telephone is whatever, in the living room and I would like to talk to my friend in the kitchen. So if you could make the cable longer, this would be nice. A longer cable, that's it, what the customer wanted. None of the customers told them, I want to go to the internet. I want to, to share some photos with, at Facebook with my friends or whatever. Yeah? Or I want to, wait to, to, to type in an SMS or write an email. I just wanted a longer cable. They could not really even imagine what uh, technology could offer to them. So this blue ocean is also really to creating something which maybe the customer at the moment does not really even know that he needs it. Now, there's a famous uh, sentence from the, from the BMW uh, R&D uh, boss who said we are we at uh, BMW, we, we try to make innovation, innovations in our cars where the customer did not know before that he needed it. But when we make the innovation and when we show this new BMW with these innovative tools to the customers, the customer tells us afterwards that this is exactly that what he always wanted to have. But he didn't know it before. And that, of course, typically blows you eliminate, you reduce something, and you create or you increase some completely new features. You make your, your customers really crazy for that. And of course, you can always only do that if you put a very strong focus on value innovation, something which really makes a value for the customer, where the customer is also willing to pay afterwards, of course. Of course, you want to sell your product, and Blue Ocean does not always mean that it's just cheap, just low. It means that you now have a price that the customer says, hey, I want that product. I'm willing to pay for it. Once again, nobody asks for the, for the price of an iPhone. You just want to have it. So once again, two, these four cornerstones. And with these four cornerstones for every promotion strategy, you can come up with a new strategy. You will always find this uh, slide in your handouts, which I'll print out for you for, the, uh, for tomorrow. And when we build up your blue ocean strategies tomorrow, together, I will always ask you that nasty question. Which of the factors could you eliminate? What could you erase? What could you create? What could you reduce? But of course, these four cornerstones are not enough to come up with really something new. You need a little bit more, a little bit more question. So, again, Blue Ocean Standard gives you a toolbox of six 
passes. You have to look at. First of all, look at alternative branches. So if you are in a, in a certain industrial branch and you are offering a product or a service to the customer, normally there is always an alternative for the customer which you maybe not, you are not even aware of. And it doesn't mean, for example, if you are, you are running a bus transportation company. So your company transports customers with the bus in the town or between towns from A to B. And of course you, as the CEO of the, of the bus company, you would say, okay, okay, of course I compete with other bus companies. Of course you do. But there's a lot more competition. You compete with trains. If the distance between A and B is longer, then you might also compete with planes, where of course you also compete with cars. So why should the customer go with your bus? He could go with, your, with his own car, he could do some car sharing, he could use the plane, he could use the train. So you're also competing with completely different branches. And for Bloch, now you can look at these branches, you can take this as a chance and say, okay, what do train companies, what do maybe car companies or car sharing or whatever, what do they do? What, and what could I learn from that? What could I maybe add some functionalities? Maybe you can, you can combine bus and, and car. You can offer to your, to your customer, if you go with the bus, with my company with the bus from A to B, when you get out of, 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 the, of the bus at B, a car will wait for you. So the long distances we go with the bus or with the train, whatever, doesn't matter. And at the end point you don't have to walk, you don't have to, to, to get a taxi. A car will wait for you. When you when you live in the bus, the car, the bus driver will everybody give the key to the car. Why not? You will be the only one, only company who does so. Of course this will cost more, but maybe, maybe, I'm not sure. The customer is willing to pay for this extra because for long distances he can go with your bus, with your train, and at the end he has a car where he can drive the last 10 or 15 kilometers to his family, to his working place, to his business partner. <coughs> Next one, there are always some groups within your approach. Once again, the, the automotive industry is a very good example. You have this luxury cars, you have the sport cars, you have the family cars. Former times you also had this console called uh, pickup. And you know one of the very few segments which is still increasing every year in the car industry is the SUVs, the sports utility vehicles. You know that many people are driving an SUV, also they are only driving in the, in the, in the town, they are only driving on the highway and they never ever go off road. Yeah? Uh, they're sitting uh, in an SUV and they're proud because the SUV is big and they're sitting in a higher position. So what the car industry did is they combined some normal, more or less normal limousines with pickups. And of course a normal pickup in a 20 years ago was much too big, causing too much uh, fuel to drive for a family and they combined it to a new uh, type of car, to an SUV. So they combined different branches within an industry and they made something new, SUV. Still increasing every year the percentage of SUVs on our streets. Also very, very important. If you're selling a product <coughs> or a service, of course you have your customer. Huh? We as Bondi, we are making paper, a lot of paper. And then we are selling this paper to retailers. So the retailer is our customer, or the person who buys the paper from the retailer. This is also our customer. And what does the person do who buys the paper from the retailer? They write on it, they paint on it, they print on it. So also the printer is our customer. 
So normally you have a lot more customers than you think of. And if you think of the whole chain of buyers, there's always normally a lot of room for innovation for you. Don't think of your customer which is just sitting one step uh, beside you. Think of the next and next after the next customer. And the way we will find some new business models or services. Complementary products and services. If you're selling a product, you can also, you can also offer a service. Right? If you're selling a computer, you can offer to a customer. It's normally done. If the computer breaks down for what reason ever, bring me the computer, I will fix the problem for you. So for computers, this is very normally done. For cars, of course. Yeah. You know that when you buy a car nowadays, the profit for the for the car trader, for the car retailer, it's less than 10%. Some years ago it was 15 to 20%, but nowadays, if they sell a car to you, that's nice, but it's, that's not really big business for him. The really business for him is the services. When he's selling a car to you, then he, he hopes that if, if he's friendly to you, if he's informing you in the right way, that you will come every year for service, you will need some maybe additional features for the car, maybe you will have some problems with the car, you need some maintenance, etc. etc. So over the years he will he will earn a lot of money because you come back to him. And that's where he really, he really makes the profit. The car is just the vehicle yeah? that he can make profit with you. The really profit comes from the service he's offering to you. Or just think of, the, of an inkjet printer. I guess everybody of you has an inkjet printer at home. Huh? Who has an inkjet printer? Hmm? Raise your hands. A printer. You, you. No printer at home? Computer? No printer? Okay. So normally, I would say 80% or so of the population, they have computer and a printer at home. And if you have a printer, if you have an inkjet printer. I'm, I'm pretty sure you don't have a laser printer. Huh? You have some kind of printer which is doing <laughs> Yes or no? No? You have a printer which is doing <laughs> Yes? Okay, then maybe you have a laser printer. But if you, if, if, if you, want, if you have to buy some new ink, how do you do that? You go to the supermarket, you go to Amazon, and you order it. And that's where really the business comes from. The printer nearly costs nothing for you. Of course, the printer costs something for the company, for you, and that, or for Canon, or whatever. But the real business comes from things. You don't think that it's making 80% of its profit by selling things. 80%. They could give you the printer for free. Just take the printer, because if you have the printer, you will print with this, with the that device, and if you print, you will need the inks, my friend. And with the inks, I make the profit. I don't, so I don't care, as, as you look back at, if the printer costs 10 euros, 50 euros. Yeah? Normally, nowadays, you get, for 50 euros, you get an excellent printer. We can copy, we can scan, whatever. Excellent uh, quality. For nearly nothing. But we will make the, the profit with the inks. Eight some motives. <coughs> if you are in a functional production, in a technical production, you can eat at some emotional motives, and vice versa. For the typical example, you know, was on, on holiday with my wife some weeks ago in Corinthia, not that far away from Maripur, and we went shopping for some, you know, what, what, what ladies need uh, shoes and handbags. You never ever can have enough handbags especially in the wife. So every holiday we need at least one or two more handbags. And then when we are in the shop, first of all, I, I, I try that our kids are not running away, and secondly, from time to time I'm looking at my wife and if the lady is offering different handbags to her. But this handbag is always very stylish and always very nice, always very, very expensive, by the way. And uh, you know, normally, 
after one minute in a, in a, in a bag shop, I'm bored. Yeah? I say, okay, take it. If, you, if you need to take the bag and let's go. Yeah? But what the, what the ladies in the shops then normally do when the, the husband is coming who's normally sponsoring this handbag, they don't say, okay, this is the latest style from Paris. They say, okay, look at this handbag. It is so nice to open or to close, so it has this, some, some new magnet uh, closure uh, device. I have no idea how to say that in English. Yeah? And this is that they don't, they don't uh, take you by emotions because you are a man, they take you by techniques. And then you have, you have three different handbags, and then I tell, I tell my wife, okay, this one is really technical, okay. I don't care if it comes from Paris or Moscow or whatever. Yeah? I say, this, this one is nice because it has these new uh, magnetic uh, closure systems. So you have these emotions and you have these technical features and you combine them to convince the customer. And last but not least, if you build up a business, it's a good idea to do it on steady trends. Not on a train which is one year or two years. Find out the steady trends and follow them, like the iPhone, like the smartphone. This is a steady trend. This is nothing that was only for one year. This is a steady trend that the mobile phones are getting like, or they are in the meantime, they are computers, not really phones. Or sustainability. Every product should, this is good for all of us, should get more green, you should do it with less water, with less materials, with less energy. So the trend of sustainability. Or the population gets older and older. Of course, you are all a bad example, not because you are young and fresh. But in real world, especially in Europe, population is getting older and older. This is a steady trend. So if you focus on products for the older generation, and with older mean the 50 plus generation, you will really have a steady trend. And you all also will get 50 plus, hopefully, in 30 years or so. So there are a lot of steady trends, and if you can identify a steady trend, and if you can find a closure, you can be pretty sure that you will have a very profitable business for many times. So I have these four cornerstones. <coughs> you have these six questions to ask, and at the end, you should be able to come up with a strategy canvas. Strategy canvas is nothing else but a strategy in a nutshell. Canvas just means some kind of uh, whiteboard. Okay, so you have some whiteboard, some text on whiteboard, which sends the canvas, and on this whiteboard or on a sheet of paper, whatever, you can write down a strategy, and you can do it very easily. And you know what distinguishes a good strategy from a bad strategy? Yeah? For a bad strategy, it takes you hours to explain, maybe 50 slides of a PowerPoint presentation and a lot of blind outcomes. If you really have a good strategy, just takes you one slide. One slide to get out and you point out what really the new business is about. That's it. That's your strategy. Full stop. And with Flowshoot, you should be able to build up that kind of strategy, which means that you identify the main drivers, the main parameters of your business. You identify what your competitors, competitors are doing, what competitive products are doing, and then, then you do something different. And here you have the scaling, scale up from low to high. It normally means that you give six points. Five to six is high, three to four is medium, and one to two is low. And don't pay too much attention to numbers. It doesn't make any sense to distinguish between number one and two. No discussion if it is 1.5 or 1.6. You can also use your gut feeling and say, okay, this is a one, this is a two. The main point is that you make a strategy that the different between if, if something is low, medium or high. <coughs> For example, the price is the <coughs> low or high. And what are the other par uh, parameters? This strategy canvas is about uh, Cirque du Soleil. You know this uh, Canadian uh, uh, circus, which is more nowadays spread all over the world, I guess. Not sure if they're also performing in Australia, but they're performing in, in, in Europe, in, in the in the US and whatever. And this is normally the textbook example of closure strategy. For some reason, however, 
the authors of every textbook and every lecture on Plotion uses this strategy canvas. So that's why I also included it. Personally, I don't like this, this example, to be honest, but this is the, like for the biologist, this is the Drosophila of Plotion. So I included it that you don't, uh, yeah, that you don't uh, tell anybody that you didn't learn the Cirque de Sol strategy when uh, attending my lecture. So what did Cirque de Sol do different? They don't have any animals. They don't have that stars. But like, other, like, like the other circus uh, in the US, they have fun, thrill and danger, and what they have is, a, is, a, is really a theme, a topic in the evening. It's not just a circus, we go there, and then comes the clown and the artist and the lions and the horses and whatever. You really have a topic, it's like in a theater. And the people are willing to pay the price of a theater ticket, which is much higher than a, than a ticket of a, of a, for a normal circus, but just go with these kids. So Cirque du Soleil reinvented the circus by combining the classical circus uh, parameters with the theater parameters. And you can see that Plotion does not always mean a, loop, a low cost strategy. It could also mean that you make a really nice profit. So this is the strategy canvas. And with the next example, we give you other examples which I like more, but this is the basis outcome of every blush. You build up a strategy. You're using these four cornerstones, you're using the six questions, and you build up this strategy, which you can show to your colleagues, which you can show to your boss, to the CEO, hopefully to get support to get on with your blush right here. So the rest of that lecture I would like now, would like now to give you another example, a more hands-on example as I guess and an example which I guess all, all of you know. Who of you is drinking a Nespresso? You know, the, the George Clooney cafe. Hmm? Hands up. Who is drinking Nespresso? I do. No idea how common this is in Slovenia. Hands up. I just want to count. To count. Hmm? Nespresso. Who is drinking Nespresso? No Nespresso? Yes, okay. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, you? No? Does this mean only the espresso machine? Sorry, what? Does this mean only the espresso machine? No, just take it. So I would say more than half of you is owning an espresso machine, you are thinking of espresso, at least from time to time. So an espresso, I think, is one of the best examples of a pollution business model. And that's why I would like to explain it to you in detail because I think we can learn a lot from this Nespresso uh, case study. Because it's very common, all of us know it. I think everybody has at least tasted one Nespresso uh, coffee in his life. Either you like it or not, but you all know it. So it's all about these capsules. You know them from the office, from your colleagues, or from the TV spots with uh, George Clooney. I have no idea, is this George Clooney also in Slovenia coming? The spots? Yes? Maybe the, 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 the ladies like, oh, know it. Yes? Okay. So you have this espresso machine and you have this nice coffee. And of course, that's why I asked the question how many of you are drinking or using espresso in this place system? Have you ever compared? <coughs> the price of a cup of, of an espresso coffee with the cup of a coffee when you would buy one kilo of coffee in the supermarket, you can buy a nice coffee, must not be the cheapest one, and you have a normal espresso machine or filter coffee machine and you are brewing this cup of coffee in a normal machine, not in an espresso machine. You are comparing the price of one kilo of coffee with the amount of coffee which is in one capsule, could open, as I learned, there are no economists here in that audience. So you all scientists, you can open this capsule, you can uh, analyze the weight, and you can pair to the one, one kilo of coffee in the supermarket. And then you can quite easily calculate the price of an espresso 
cup of coffee with the price of a cup of coffee if you would buy it in the supermarket, a kilogram coffee and brew it on your own. And if you, if you calculate, and of course it depends on the exact uh, brand of coffee you're buying and of the exact uh, Nespresso cup, we are all idiots and we are all completely foolish. Right? Because we are all willing, or the Nespresso made us willing to pay 10 times or even more for one cup of coffee. That's why I always ask this question, because it's always nice that you're not the only foolish person in the world. We all, we're all sitting in the audience completely full of idiots. Yeah? If you would calculate it, you would immediately start crying. You can tell. So the question is, why do we do it? Yeah? And why is the business model of Nespresso that successful? Because from a pure economic point of view, it's completely rubbish. So nowadays, it's even more than 35 countries. It's, it's nearly 50 countries worldwide. Every year, they are, I would nearly say, they are conquering a new country, Espresso. Like McDonald's, they are nearly worldwide operating. It's part of the Nestle uh, company, one of the largest food companies worldwide. Nestle is a, is a company selling different kinds of foods, but normally not machine. And it, as you know, Nespresso is of course a combination of kettles and machines. And uh, total turnover, the, the revenue in 2010 was 3.2 billion uh, Swiss francs, which is in euro about, and I think the latest numbers for 2012 were even higher, so it's about 2.8, 2.9 in the meantime billion euros. So it, it's, it's nearly 3 billion euros in the meantime, the revenue per year of Nespresso. So they're making a lot of profit because we're all foolish. Or well, because we all love George Clooney, this could also be. So the company, history in a nutshell, what did they do? And were they always successful? And the answer is very simple, no. Uh, they also had, a, had to go through a, a, a valley of tears. This place was started many, many years ago in the, in the 1860s. Yeah? Then there was this idea born at Nestle, some of the it's normally crazy R&D guys that we could put this uh, roasted and grinded uh, coffee in a kettle and offer it to companies, to restaurants. To offices. So not, not to the normal customer, not to you, not to me. So it was typically, as economists call it, a B2B, a business to business model. We as a business company, we as uh, Nespresso offer you as a business company, like a restaurant, like a coffee shop, we offer you the capital system. So you can put the capitals into your machine, just put the, the, the button and you have a nice coffee. And there was another. Similar <coughs> systems in the market. <coughs> so the original idea was definitely not a pollution theory idea. It was completely red ocean. We at Nestle, we will also now start this business. We also want to have a, a piece of the cake. Other companies are doing it. Why don't we also do that? And the CEO said, okay, yes, let's have a try. And then this press is done. It was not that successful as you can see here. Yeah? Some years later, they had the, they had the idea why we don't offer also our offer to normal customers, to normal people. The world is full of idiots. Yeah? Why don't we offer this system to normal customers? Starting with the Swiss, B2C, business to customers. Now you, especially in Switzerland, you could buy that machine, you could buy, you could buy these, these kettles, and at home you could brew, easily, easily brew and, and cook this excellent coffee. The night is. This was now a blue ocean because this has never ever 
be in the market before. It was completely new, the market was completely open to you, but of course it doesn't mean that this must be a success, but at least the market was at yours. You could still see that it was, was still not, not a great success. But it eventually, you, know, you could see the increase. And then, many years later, when you already were quite successful in the B2C business, also by far not that as successful as, successful as they are nowadays, there was no George Clooney here at, that, at those days, they went back to the Red Ocean. They said, okay, now we know that our customers, uh, many customers in Switzerland, in Germany, etc., they like the system, so now we are again offering the system to the bars, to the restaurants that you can now also drink your favorite Nespresso cup of coffee in a bar, in a coffee bar. So they went back from the Blue Ocean to the Red Ocean. And as you know, some years ago, the George Clooney effect, yeah, George Clooney becomes the global Nespresso ambassador. You can see him on many TV spots. And You can see still this nearly perfect shape of this curve. This e potent. And this curve is still going up and up and up. Of course, someday it will go like that. It will level off, as we say in mathematics, but so far, still increasing every year. So nowadays everybody knows it, most of the people like it, and most of the people are willing, <coughs> maybe willing to pay an extraordinary price just to drink an espresso, a cup of coffee. And this is part of the answer. Why do we all do that? Yeah? We are not really idiots, I hope so. I guess so. But we are, there are some features in this place which we like as a customer. And that's why we are willing to pay for it. For example, the coffee quality. Normally, I would say, personally, I would say that the coffee quality from this place is quite okay. So it's really nice. I mean, I'm not a, a coffee specialist, I have to admit. Also, I'm living in Vienna. Uh, but coffee is really nice. You have different capsules, you can, yeah, you have different tastes. And, you in Christmas time, you can even drink some, some chocolate coffee and whatever. They also have, always, always have these this, this special offers over Christmas and the waste and whatever. And the, the coffee is really nice. So the quality is really, is really, is really excellent, I would say. And it's very simple. You just have these capsules and you, of course you have to put in some water into your machine. Water you need for every coffee machine and that's it. Yeah? Nothing else. You put in the capsule, you put in the water and uh, even I understood within less than, win than one minute how to use this coffee machine. Now I don't need the help of my, of my assistant to, 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 to cook some coffee. I can do it on my own. It's very easy. You can't do anything wrong. You know, when you have a high-end espresso machine, you have different buttons and you can tune anything and you really have to, to read the manual. I know my wife had, had a very excellent and very expensive coffee machine. Nowadays we have just you know, gave it to our parents-in-law because we don't need it any, any longer with human espresso. And this was that kind of manual. Yeah? It was really technical, like, like the manual for an airplane. You could change every parameter of this espresso machine. It's really complicated stuff. And for the espresso, just put in the capsule, you just have to make sure that there's enough water, enough water in the machine and then you press the button and that's it. Done. Well, it's really simple, it's a good quality. And what they really do excellent right, is this service, this customer relation. Right? You have this uh, special Nespresso uh, shops. I don't know if there's a, in Maripur is there any Nespresso shop? No? In Ljubljana, maybe? No. no? Okay, not yet. I'm pretty sure it will come. In, in Vienna, we have two uh, Nespresso shops, I guess, and in also 
the other towns like Graz, Linz, we always, we always have at least one uh, espresso coffee shop. So, shopping, or the espresso shopping is an experience. You get in this huge coffee shop, uh, you have this nice looking lady there smiling at you and they're offering different tastes of coffee and they ask you whatever you want and you can of course not always buy some coffee, you can also buy some chocolate, you can buy some new stylish coffee machines, you can buy some uh, milk uh, creamers and whatever. So a lot of stuff built around Nespresso and this makes this Nespresso a success story. They are not only offering coffee, they offer much more and they build up a very strong customer relation with you. You are becoming a member of this Nespresso Club. Yeah? You're getting a, a member card. A member card, and again, when you enter the, this, this, this shop, you have to put in your card, and then the, the lady at the shop knows who you are, and says, hey, you know Mr. Connie, nice to see you again. Of course, she's never seen you before, but anyway, she says that, and you're getting some coffee, and some extra gifts, and whatever. Yeah? You really feel like a personal relation to Nespresso. You are becoming a member of the club. <coughs> this customer relation is extremely important. And if we now look at this uh, strategy canvas, you remember, the strategy canvas is the, is the heart of the closure theory, and the closure strategy. You must be able, if you have a good strategy, to put it down on one canvas, on one whiteboard, on one slide. On the, what is this violet line? Is the normal uh, instant coffee. And the greenish one is this uh, coffee powder machine, the filter machine. <coughs> the blue or the bluish one is the espresso. And the espresso, this complicated machine, so I need a manual like that, which of course is good for paper instead because a lot of paper is consumed. Is the, is, the, is the reddish one. Yeah? So, once again, the price of a cup of an espresso is quite high. Maybe only the price of an instant coffee. You know, when you buy this plastic bag, bags in the supermarket where you have to heat your water and then you open this bag and you put the bag in this hot water and then you have to steer it. And, and normally I, I mess it out when I, and I do it once in a year because uh, parts of this powder are somewhere else, but not, not in the cup. Maybe here the, the price is even higher, but this price is really high pricing. But the uh, simplicity is excellent. Stop, yeah? There's no other system which is as simple as this Espresso Espresso machine is simple, but can change a lot of parameters. You should really read really, really the manual. The coffee powder machine in the daily use is even less simple because you have to do it. You have to make the filter, you have to fill in the water, you have to be sure that you take the right amount of coffee powder, which I think was always a, a secret of, of my kind master. He was make like a, he would call it a, a really a procedure how to make the exact about two and a half spoon of coffee from a, from a grandfather. So it's not really simple. And, and uh, least simple is, of course, this instant uh, coffee, where you have these bags and you have to open it and you have to heat the water extra in the microwave and whatever. Then you have to compare the <coughs> you, you need a spoon and uh, the, the output is not, is not, not always a coffee. Sometimes it's just a black liquid, something which you immediately, yeah which you have used to drink. Quality is high. If you really have an excellent espresso machine, maybe the quality is even better than for espresso, but normally espresso can compete with uh, espresso machines. So it's much better than filter coffee or instant coffee. The design of the espresso machines, in combination with, with the George Clooney spots, of course. Yeah, you have some excellent brands, some excellent design. And you have this customer relation. This is com something completely new. Normally, if you buy some, some kind of coffee in the supermarket, you have no relation to the coffee. You just buy it because it's cheap. Yeah? And next month, when another coffee is cheap, you will buy this coffee. That's it. Full stop. 
You know, you're not a member of a coffee club if you go to the supermarket and you buy one kilogram of coffee. Huh? The cashier don't ask you, ah, are you a member? You just want to have money and then next one. So no relationship. Here you really have this very, very tight relationship. So, what did Nespresso do right? So they were the first, yes. Is this the full answer? And as I already told you, Nespresso is really looking at the full value chain. Not only selling coffee, selling a lot of more goods, services. <coughs> The first mover advantage. They were the first to pay go to the business to customer, to the single customer, and to offer them this capital system for coffee. That at home, you can make in a very easy, simple, cleanish way your own coffee. What can you do if you're the first one? Of course, you can do IP protection, you can find it a pattern. Maybe some of you have already done that. I know that, yeah, Ingos. One pattern, two pattern, even more. I'm pretty sure if you're in your time at university or when you're later on for companies or still work at the university, you will also file in some patterns. If you have a really brand new idea and you and your boss and your colleagues saying this could be something we could make a business out of it, then you want to have to somehow secure this idea, this intellectual property. You file in a pattern. Of course, there's best to also that. Once again, you're part of the Nestle and the concern there. Look at it in Switzerland, and of course, they know how to do patterns. But of course, nowadays, you know, a patent, uh, the longest time a patent is valid is 20 years. After 20 years, every patent uh, is no longer existing. It has no juridical uh, right. Just stops existing. I don't know how to say it correctly in English, but I think you know what I mean. 20 years is the lifespan of a, tip, is of a pattern, the maximum lifespan. After 20 years, everybody can copy you, and you can do nothing against it. So when and you remember, it started in 1986, plus 20, so that's 2006. Since 2006, everybody can put coffee in capsules, Make a machine, this is not, these cafe machines are not really technical high-end machines. Everybody, every student or every, every mechanical student after the first semester, <coughs> sorry, could build up such a, such a machine. So IP protection is important, but that's not all. That's not the full answer. If you are the first, you can try to build up some brand quality so that the customers are loyal to their brand, they are connected to their brand. You have no switching costs because you're the first. You know, normally when you enter a market, a red market, and you have a new product, <coughs> something new, <coughs> the customer will have to pay for some switching costs, for some changes. They have to buy some new device, some new gimmick. This costs money. Here you're the first one. We are the first to offer capsules for your home. Of course, you have to buy the machine, but like you are a packet for uh, the other inkjet printing companies, we give you the machine nearly for free. Yeah? Same as for the Nespresso system. So nearly no switching cost, but as you're the first, you can start up building strategic partnerships with the machine manufacturers, and of course, which is always very important if you're the first one. You can establish you can promote a standard. You're the first one. Nobody knows better than you. It's your approach. You can define how big is this capsule. How is the shape of the capsule? How does it look like? Is it aluminium? Is it plastics? Whatever. Of course, in the meantime, there are some copies of this Nespresso system. But for many, many years, this was the Nespresso standard. You can establish the standard. And of course, you will establish the standard where you can make the most profit out of it. This standard and this partnership, this is more, normally this is much, much more than just IP protection, just filing in some patterns. 
this really gives you an economical advantage. But of course, when you're the first, you can also fail. You also have some disadvantages. You can never ever be sure if there's really a demand for cafe in capsules. I also know my uh, mother-in-law that for many years refused to have an espresso machine because she told me that for the last, whatever, 50 years she did <coughs> the, the, the cup in this, in this filter and she will never ever use this strange foolish capsules. Uh, for what reason? Should she, should, she, should she do it? Nowadays she also has an espresso machine. You can never be sure if the business model is right, if the people really buy it, if you can really make profit. And what Nespresso did, they did not build their own machines, they searched for partners. Partners who built the machine for them, which of course also means that these partners have the risk. They don't sell the machines, if they fail, it's not Nestle, it's not Nespresso, it's these partners who fail. And the profit, again, the profit comes from selling the capital, not from selling the machines. Of course, Nespresso has to share some of this profit to the manufacturers who make the machines, because otherwise they just, they just would not uh, make the machines. But the real profit is not the machine, the coffee machine, the real profit is not the engine printer. The real profit is the consumables, the coffee, the ink. And that's what Nespresso uh, does. The full value chain, from harvesting the coffee, brewing it, grinding it, up to these members. You are not only a coffee drinker, you are a member of the espresso coffee culture, an espresso coffee drink. And to be honest, it feels much better to be a member than to be a customer in the entire shop. People are willing to pay. So the conclusion is, even from a pure point of price, as I said in the beginning, we are all fools. We are willing to pay a considerable amount more of money because we are drinking this espresso coffee. The business model is still very, very effective. And this is success is on the one hand because they were the first to go into the business to uh, consumer markets. But of course, as you could see in the, in the profit curve, for many years they did not make much revenue and profit. Of course, in that time it was very good that behind Nespresso was Nestle, and Nestle was doing excellent profit. So if you have a strong mass in behind you, of course this helps if you come up with a plosion. Plosion does not always mean that you have immediately profit in the next year. It could always be that, could also be that for three or four years you have to go through a valley of tears before you. IP protection is important, but what is much, much more important is to have more customers to find a trick, to really to bind the customer to your product, that the customer is not just going to the supermarket and just buying another coffee, that the customer needs your product, that he needs your service. If you're driving a special car, then please, the car trader will tell you that, whatever, if you're driving an auto, then please don't only come back to me, because if you go to a different uh, maintenance uh, or service uh, office, the service will not be the same, and maybe they will ruin your car, etc. If you are running a certain inkjet printer at home, you need this certain ink. If you're using a different ink, the printer will maybe collapse, the, the printouts will not be the same, the quality, quality will be less, etc. If you have an espresso machine, you need the espresso capsules to have this high quality coffee. No other capsule is uh, available for that. So these are normally the most effective business models, yeah? if you find something like that. So, last slide, no worries. I know time is running. 
What I would now ask you for tomorrow. You have one night in between. I know, of course, you're supposed to sleep in the night. Not always only think about notion. But I hope that everybody of you, till tomorrow, has at least, he or she has at least one idea for a potential blue ocean model. And tomorrow we will split up in three groups. First we will make some competition, let's call it like that. So everybody will maybe present his idea. I hope that, that's why I hope that everybody has at least one idea. It could even be a foolish idea. Yeah? Think of uh, the famous scientist Niels Bohr, yeah? one of the godfathers of quantum mechanics. And Niels Bohr says that when you really want to invent something new, you cannot be mad enough. So tomorrow I'm really eager for your completely foolish ideas, whatever. And we will try to take the three most foolish ideas and to make a business model in the workshop with this explosion. And at the end, I would like to have at least a, a very rough uh, strategy canvas. Yeah? And maybe if the business model is successful, then you can go to the Zoom, you can go to a team and say, hey, we have a great idea, we have the technology, we have the business model, so all we maybe need is some support from Rasum, from the network, etc. <coughs> and you can start your own business. So maybe tomorrow you can walk out after the workshop and just say, okay, I don't uh, attend the rest of the summer school, sorry. I will immediately start my own business. That's a game for tomorrow. Thank you. See you tomorrow.